They were our friends, our family, our constant companions. We grew up, they stayed young, waiting for our memories to bring them back to life. This lever puts the power winds into action. And Big Bruiser does it again. Silly Putty can bounce higher than any bomb you've ever had. Wow! And you make them just look. Although many of the toys from our childhood have come and gone, there are those special few that will never be forgotten. Beneath our beds and in the dusty corners of our closets, there will always be room for more favorite toys. Just the two of us, we can make it if we try. Just the two of us, just the two of us. don't involve air travel at all, but they still bring people closer together. Panasonic is making ordinary camcorders extinct. Because our new palm quarter camcorder is also a digital still camera. Its pictures can be emailed, and since it's from Panasonic, its tapes play a new VCR. The Palm Quarter, with built-in digital still camera from Panasonic, just slightly ahead of our time. You're watching Sunday Showcase on Discovery Channel. Remember just how good homemade soup can taste? Well, it'll all come back to you at Tim Hortons. When you try a delicious new Tim's Own Chicken Noodle, it's got bow tie pasta noodles, sliced carrots, red peppers, and chunks of seasoned chicken, all in a hearty chicken broth. New Tim's Own Chicken Noodle. You'll love every drop. No matter how you get it, come home for lunch at Tim Hortons. Every business has its share of people who, well, don't bring a lot to the table, who never quite grow into the job. Maybe the car you drive should be included on your resume. After all, if it's the stylish, reliable Civic, you've obviously got a good head on your shoulders. So, how was your weekend? The 99 Civic from Honda. You know how to get there. Item four. Any questions? Come on, speak up. What makes a great toy? The answer to that question comes in as many shapes and sizes as toys themselves. For some, toys were a stand-in for the grown-ups they wanted to become. Cooks like magic. Hey, who's running Dad's power tool? That's not Dad. It's his. The toy. It is what you want your children to have and what you want the world to be. This is the dream in toys. For others, a way to escape the pressures of being a child. As kids, you have no control over anything, except with toys, where you are always in control. And for many, a magic key that unlocked the powers of imagination. Looks like real. Sounds like real. But great toys endure. On store shelves, in toy chests, and in our memories. People always look for these big hidden meetings, and it's just, it's time to look back that you had a history that you forgot about. It's just a simple time, and your best friends in life, next to your dog, is your toys. That is good. Go. Yes, Go. They traveled to the moon in the pockets of Apollo 8 astronauts. An Ohio zoo used it to create casts of gorilla hands and feet. It's a solid. It's also a liquid and it's one of America's most enduring playthings. Hey! Hey! It's Silly Putty time! Yes, there are hours and hours of fun in the little egg that Silly Putty comes in.
The invention of Silly Putty happened quite by accident when a scientist at General Electric was searching for a new material to construct billiard balls. There was no way to make billiard balls during World War II because ivory wasn't accessible. Here. So they needed a substitute for ivory. And they tried without much success. But a very single-minded scientist decided he'd try at it. One day, by accident, he dropped some bicarbonate of soda into some silicone oil. And it polymerized, which is to say it became the solid liquid. This odd substance didn't seem to have any obvious use, but in 1949, an out-of-work marketing consultant named Peter Hodgson learned about the strange stuff and its bizarre properties. The new material could bounce like a rubber ball, be molded into a variety of shapes, and when left alone, turned into a puddle. Hodgson thought there might be a market for this weird substance. And since it had so many odd qualities, he called it Silly Putty. Hello there. Hodgson himself even pitched the new toy on Saturday morning television commercials. And in all of this world, nothing else is Silly Putty. And silly Putty could be flattened out into a kind of a pancake, pressed on the paper, and it would pull up a wonderfully vivid, detailed image. It didn't take long before millions of imaginative children were experimenting with Silly Putty. We'd water it up in balls, bounce it on the floor, bounce it off the wall, then we'd put it in our dog's hair, anything to make our mom mad or dad mad, because it was a kid's toy, but Silly Putty was something that actually made the parents upset. You know, because it would always get in the carpet and it would always be a big mess, so you'd get it for like a day and then she'd take it away from you. Within one year, six million units were sold. One of the keys to success was the inventive packaging. Silly Putty was shaped into one-ounce balls and then packaged into multicolored plastic eggs. The idea was that the product had to be uniform. It had to be called Silly Putty, it had to be packaged in this snazzy way, and it had to always be the same, and so it cost a dollar. Silly Putty's worth many, many dollars in fun. But the wonderful fact is, it cost just one. And that's what it cost in 1949, and that's what it cost in 1976. It was one of those things that just wasn't going to change. Today, the low price and success of Silly Putty endures. It has become a timeless toy. And incredibly to date, over 200 million eggs of Silly Putty have been sold. In this wide, wide world, nothing else is Silly Putty. Hey! Hey! It's Silly Putty time! Silly Putty is lots of fun for everyone. One of our most fondly remembered favorite toys started out as a way to dress up an ordinary potato. children have been transforming lumpy spuds into Mr. Potato Head. Mr. Potato Head is entertaining. He makes us laugh. Whether we are a preschool child playing with the Mr. Potato Head toy or we're an adult, there's something really funny about Mr. Potato Head. Mr. Potato Head was the brainchild of model maker George Lerner. Originally distributed as a gift in cereal boxes, Lerner soon knew he was onto something big. He brought it to Hasbro. They saw a simple concept, a unique concept, and an idea that would make a very successful toy. Mr. Potato Head arrived in stores in 1952, and from the start was a complete sellout. In the first year, it sold over a million units. Inside was a collection of your basic potato parts, eyes, ears, nose, mouth, hat, some glasses, and you ask mom for a potato, and you pop the pieces in, and when you were finished, you had a Mr. Potato Head. Mr. Potato Head quickly moved to the top of the toy field, but the single spud was lonely. 
it only took a year for the potato bachelor to find true love. In 1953, he was partnered with Mrs. Potato Head. Mr. and Mrs. Potato Head with their own cars and trailers. That's what's new. For the next 11 years, life went unchanged for the Potato Heads. But in 1964, Hasbro introduced a new Mr. Potato Head that saved many a real potato from being sacrificed to child's play. We made the decision to pack a plastic body Mr. Potato Head along with the park. And that decision was made after watching children play with the toy. And it was determined that it would be easier for kids to insert the pieces into pre-made holes rather than trying to get them into a potato. Over the years, Hasbro introduced other plastic food toys, but none rivaled the popularity of the original potato. We'd put his eyeballs and his mouth over here and his nose over here and just not make it look normal, just totally distort Mr. Potato Head. <laughs> to date, over 50 million potato heads have found their way into the hands of imaginative children. Mr. Potato Head is a classic because he is relevant over time. We grew up playing with Mr. Potato Head. Our children grew up playing with Mr. Potato Head. He's bigger than a toy. He's part of the fabric of American culture. That buzz. That infernal, wonderful buzz. That is the buzz around Operation. Operation. It's Operation. Milton Bradley's goofy game for dopey dockers. Marvin Glass, one of the great toy designers, was Operation's chief of surgery. But as one colleague remembers, the game took some getting used to. The theme of operating was pretty off the wall at the time. I mean, if I would suggest, let's make a game where we're actually operating on a guy and removing pieces from his body, that concept probably wouldn't sound very good. So it was relatively new at the time and certainly a little bit off the wall for the early 60s. Skill and action go into every operation. Here's your patient. You take a card. Remove funny bones. Careful, if you touch the sides, you blew it, Charlie. Players must carefully extract what is known in the game as funatomy from long-suffering cavity Sam. If you touch the side, your turn is over. You're not removing somebody's lower intestine. That's not very funny. But if you're taking water off somebody's knee or an Adam's apple, which is actually an apple out of his throat, uh, there's humor there. Created in the days before HMOs and managed care, Operation was definitely a fee-for-service medical game. Obviously, the more you achieve, the more money you win, and the object of the game is when all the parts are gone to have the most money at the end of the game. When you're down very close, delicately trying to pick out a piece and it buzzes, you jump, no matter how many times you do it. And I think that's the first thing that entertained children. It was a concept of a safe scare. And that annoying buzz is one of the secrets to the game's success. As the history of rock and roll proves, the more parents hate a sound, the more their children love it. Careful if you touch the sides. 35 years later, Operation is still manufactured like it is played, with extreme care. The greatest thing about watching Operation being made is not only the interesting way in which all the elements come together, but at the end of the assembly line, there's one person who has to put in the nose on Cavity Sam, and then that nose gets tested a couple of times before it gets put into the box. So here's to the naked guy with the big red nose, the chronic patient who's given his body to science for more than two generations.
Our new Steakhouse Bacon Cheeseburger with its smoked blend of processed Swiss and cheddar, bacon, and sautéed onions in a steak sauce has turned Wendy's into a first-class steakhouse. Welcome to Wendy's. Table up front. Dig in. Weeknights. Get wild. You have at least an hour every night. Wild Discovery. Nature's finest hour. Weeknights on Discovery Channel. Next week, I'm sure I mentioned the golf trip to you. I left the seat up again. The Oil of Olay Holiday Gift Set. It won't make up for all the things you've done wrong this year, but it's a start. Spiritual retreat. Fun. Kisses in every bag? Because they go really fast. Little Hershey's Kisses, big chocolate taste. There are favorite toys that played with our minds. And then, there are toys that played with our bodies. What began as a simple exercise aid transformed a small toy company into a household name. Although it was banned in some countries due to the provocative movement it provoked, young and old fans alike embraced it. It was a cultural phenomenon that indelibly marked the 1950s, a twisting, undulating ring known around the world as hula hoop. We used to love getting as many as we could on our body, on our arms, on our waist, on our knees, on our ankles, and just wiggle around and see how many we can get going and how fast we can get them rolling around. Friends would have them on their arms. I would try to do it on my arms. You try to do it around your neck. You try to do two or three at a time. And wherever you would go when I was young, you would see kids on the street with their hula hoop. I couldn't hula hoop. I could never master the technique. Um, obviously, I tried a few times, but the best I would ever do is I'd throw it, it'd spin around a couple times and fall to the ground. The hula hoop craze became one of the most extraordinary fads in toy history. It was the right toy at the right time, and the right time was 1958. The hula hoop came out, I think, at a very uh, opportune time in American history uh, because of the uh, sort of the end of the 1950s, the country sort of maturing a little bit, breaking out of its its shell. This is a time period when the television wouldn't show us Elvis down to the hips because that was too outrageous emotion that he was going through when he was singing. So now, an excuse to make that very movement in public was a pretty good deal. It didn't take long to catch on. In the first year, the hula hoop frenzy swept across the nation. Boys and girls stood in lines to purchase their first hoop. Within four months, over 25 million were sold. Within two years, over 100 million. Since the late 1950s, if a toy was wild and wacky, chances are it came from a company as innovative and instantly memorable as its name, Whammo. The name actually originated uh, with the original founders who, whose first product was a slingshot and they named the company after the sound that the slingshot makes when you pull it back and let it go. It makes a whammo sound, which uh, they really loved and thought it was a great name for the company. 
super balloon. It's about 10 feet long and made of a plastic film that's strong. To inflate, run into the... Over the years, Whammo enjoyed remarkable success with a variety of different toys. Over and over again. From the high-velocity super balls that bounced wildly to the quarter mile of silly strings shot out of an aerosol can. Whammo was always clever and outrageous. Together, there's almost nothing. But in the case of Hula Hoop, it was outrageously popular. The Hula Hoop was invented when the original founders of Whammo went to Australia on a product searching mission and came upon Australian school children who were using a bamboo hoop for exercise in the schoolyard. And they looked at it and they said, wow, this looks like fun. We think kids all over the world will like it. The hoop was christened Hula after the hip swaying dance performed by Polynesian Islanders. Originally made out of ash wood, Whammo quickly developed a plastic version of the hoop and began demonstrating the new toy in local playgrounds near their Southern California headquarters. Within one year, domestic sales skyrocketed and the hula hoop craze went global, spreading throughout the free world. It needs a lot to take a German's mind off his work. But hula hoop comes first, last, and all the time in Hamburg at the moment. Since it originated in Australia, of course, it had sort of international uh, roots going on into Europe and other parts of the world. Many, many people got excited about it. Hula hooping was popular everywhere, and in some places, almost rivaling the craze status it achieved in the United States. This hoop they do is contagious. They've got the cameraman doing it without a hoop. No hoop, two hoops. Where will it all end? There's something fun and maybe slightly provocative about swinging your hips and having that hoop go around. I think we'd have to say that the hula hoop is an American icon. It's an image that people pick to show that period of time, to show a particular joy of simpler things. And so probably that's its most enduring contribution. When the hula hoop craze passed, Whammo was not caught off guard. They were ready with another bombshell for the toy world. Whammo actually introduced the Frisbee prior to introducing the hula hoop. But the Frisbee didn't immediately take off in the way that the hula hoop did. So it was really delayed by the, the development of the hula hoop because the company could only pay attention to so much and they had their hands completely full with the hula hoop. The Frisbee actually had Ivy League origins. In the 1920s, students at Yale University were fond of playing catch with metal pie tins they procured from the Frisbee Baking Company of Bridgeport, Connecticut. The college students would take these pie tins and throw them at each other and yell, Frisbee, uh, I guess to get the other person's attention before it hit him in the head or something. And they would catch it and throw it back, of course. It would be almost 30 years before a better flying disc was invented. In 1948, a building inspector named Fred Morrison invented a plastic disc that floated effortlessly when thrown in the air. He called it a flying saucer to capitalize on the UFO sightings that occurred in Roswell, New Mexico a year earlier. The Whammo owners heard about it and thought, this is a great product. I think we should work with Fred Morrison and put this out as a Whammo product. And that's what they did. It was very carefully designed so that it looked like a little spaceship. And it had a porthole series at the top, so I guess that's where the little spacemen were. And around the edge were all the planets. So the names of the planets were around the edge, and it was called the Pluto Platter. So it was really a space toy. The Pluto Platter came out in 1957. It sold moderately well, but appeared to be more of a passing fad. But in 1958, one of the owners of Whammo was visiting an Ivy League college when he heard the flying pie tin story and the name Frisbee. He liked it, changed the spelling slightly, and trademarked the name for Whammo. Their flying disc would now be known as Frisbee. 
as the hula hoop craze faded in the early 1960s, a frisbee frenzy took flight. Because the frisbee is such a portable toy, kids and young adults toss the flying disc everywhere. One of the favorite locations for frisbee games became the beach. The 1950s, 1960s beach culture really contributed to the popularity of the frisbee. It's ideal for the beach. And then a frisbee, by virtue of the fact that it's not a ball, really stood out as a way for the younger generation, if you will, to have a toy of their own. You know, it's this tiny little plastic disc that seems so simple, yet it's, you're only limited to your imagination what you can do with it. It's, it's just kind of an all-in-one game for a kid. The public fancy for Frisbee flight continues to soar today, some 40 years after it was first introduced. Each year, more Frisbees are purchased than baseballs, basketballs, and footballs combined. To date, over 100 million Frisbees have been sold. It more than qualifies as one of America's favorite toys. The Frisbee's status as a classic toy is pretty secure. First of all, it's so clearly an American invention discovery. It's also has had such long-term durability and appeal. It has developed in such interesting ways that it's part of the culture now in a way that some other games don't necessarily earn that right because they come and go so quickly. You get homesick every day. You have a lot of time to think, and the more you think, the more you wish you were home. I'm a naval acoustics operator on board HMCS Toronto in the Persian Gulf. Our email goes out twice a week. There's a lot of the guys will write about what they're missing. I miss my wife and my son. And I also miss my Tim Hortons coffee. A lot of people can't make it through a day without a good coffee. <laughs> Minister of National Defense came to visit us and he uh, told us someone at home had, had heard our call and Tim Hortons had uh, sent over many cases. There was quite a, quite a loud cheer throughout. If you can't bring family over here, you gotta bring something to bring, bring a little bit of home. Hi Maureen, Nathan, can't wait to get home and be with both of you. Hello. Yeah, just a sec. Hold on. Daddy? It's for you. Giga Ring. <laughs> Young people need challenges. As house mother of five beta theta, I insist that my boys tackle the kitchen, scrubbing every pan, even the impossible to clean ones. Now with the revolutionary power of Cascade Gel, you can put things in the dishwasher you never thought you could. Because Cascade Gel breaks up many tough foods better. While the number two national leading gel can leave this, Cascade Gel gets what they leave behind. They make a mother proud. Cascade Gel, so clean it's virtually spotless. Remember that chlorine smell from your dishwasher? Now it's gone. Introducing Cascade Plus. It cleans great and leaves a crisp scent with no chlorine smell. New Cascade Plus. A fresh scent. A great clean. You want the coffee and not the cream. You want great Pantene shine without all the conditioner of the two-in-one. That's why there's new Pantene Pro-V shampoo only. You know what you want and what you don't. toys don't have to be complicated to be classic. For example, what could be simpler than a plastic pie plate? A big hoop? 
Well, try artistically shaped and dramatically colored pieces of plastic. It's colorful and fun. Its logo is one of the most recognizable in the toy industry. It's known for its distinctive packaging. But most importantly, it has allowed pint-sized Picassos and miniature Michelangelos to serve their artistic muses for over 45 years. And it all started, as so many great toys do, with the right people, at the right time, capturing creative lightning in a bottle. The color forms truly just happened. The story of color forms began in the bathroom of Patricia and Harry Kislevitz. In 1951, as struggling art students, the couple received an unusual gift from a friend. So we got these gigantic rolls of plastic. And when they came, we didn't know exactly what to do with them. So uh, I put them in the bathroom. Patricia and her husband found that small pieces of the plastic clung to the semi-gloss paint walls. And being artists, they knew just what to do. They cut out various shapes and sizes and decorated their bathroom then left scissors and some vinyl out for their friends to play with. That creative lightning was about to strike. They were in there making wonderful Matisse layouts up and down the walls and on the mirrors and on the bathtubs and every place. So um, we looked at it and said, hey, that's, that's a great idea. With its distinctive oversized black box, Color Forms had taken the toy market by storm in less than 12 months. Color Forms soon added a new twist. Cartoon characters. Now children could battle giants with the Jack and the Beanstalk set. Grow beautiful flowers with the Betsy McCall garden dress kit. And she can wear overalls. Just like Or explore the planets the with the Space Planetary Warrior Adventure set. Need is your imagination and a little help from Color Form. And in this day of high-tech computer and video games, it is the simplicity of Color Forms that has made it one of our favorite toys. Because Color Forms demands a certain amount of imagination on the child's part. And a child wants to, to express himself. originally designed as a wallpaper cleaning solution. And its mysterious formula is one of the best kept secrets in the toy business. And one whiff of its intoxicating smell can transport us back into childhood. Play-Doh. Over the years, we've manufactured over 700 million pounds of Play-Doh, which represents about two billion cans. If you extruded all 700 million pounds of Play-Doh in one of our fun factories, it would circle the globe 300 times. Like so many of our favorite toys, Play-Doh was invented by accident in 1956. A man named Joe McVickers was in search of a wallpaper cleaning compound and instead came up with a compound that he found could be molded. Joe McVickers' sister was a teacher and when she saw the compound that was discovered, she thought that her children in her classroom might really enjoy playing with it. The pliable compound turned out to be a hit with the kids. It was soft, easy to shape, and less oily than regular modeling clay. Soon, McVicker's mysterious compound graduated from kindergarten to an educational convention where it was spotted by the wife of a department store buyer. The Play-Doh phenomenon had begun. Hi, Mom! The Play-Doh boy! But you look different! So that's because I'm made out of new, brighter colored Play-Doh! When color was added to Play-Doh, kids couldn't keep their hands off the squishy stuff. Kids love to squish it and squash it and make all kinds of things! And the new, brighter colors make Play-Doh even more fun! You're fun, too! <laughs> I had all colors, pink, yellow, blue, green, we used to make um, people, used to make cars, you know, played with it all the time. 
There is more to Plato than unfettered imagination. The sensual pleasures of this product are beyond compare. In fact, the makers of Plato consider the smell of the toy so important they have never revealed the way it is produced. Scent is a really key attribute to Plato. What gives Plato its scent is a secret even to me. They don't tell me, and it's a secret we guard very closely. Over the years, Plato came packaged with various play sets that allowed kids to sculpt the compound into all varieties of shapes and designs. But like any timeless classic, the simple pleasures still endure. The basic Play-Doh play, which is taking that slug of dough and being able to squish it up in your hands and pound out different shapes, has continued since its very inception. With some of the most advanced safety systems ever engineered into a 4x4, including QuadraDrive, our most advanced four-wheel drive system ever, and an all-new quick-response steering system, it's no wonder the all-new Jeep Grand Cherokee is one of the safest ways to cross treacherous terrain. The all-new Jeep Grand Cherokee, the most capable sport utility ever. We have a cinnamon macadamia encrusted sea bass and a warm banana chutney. Looking for something really delicious? Painted chicken neck with the mango habanero mojo and sauce romanesco. Sauce what? <laughs> we recommend Wendy's new steakhouse bacon cheeseburger, a smoked blend of processed Swiss and cheddar bacon, and sauteed onions in a savory steak sauce. And finally, a warm lobster cappuccino. Lobster cappuccino? Lobster cappuccino. I hear it. I just don't believe it. Wendy's new steakhouse bacon cheeseburger. Dig in. Introducing new Maxwell House Instant Dark Roast. A bolder version of the original, but still good to the last drop. Introducing new Maxwell House Instant Light Roast. A smoother, mellower version of the original, but still good to the last drop. screens upon which we project our imagination but there is one toy that took that process of projection literally for over 60 years millions of children and adults have been transported to faraway lands through the magic of this timeless toy. When we would vacation, instead of postcards, you bought Viewmasters, and then when you went home, it was 3D, and uh, it's like you were there. I remember as a child having a Viewmaster, and that was the first time I saw the Taj Mahal. Of course, I'd never be able to get to the Taj Mahal, and I remember that to this day. You couldn't really see the pictures until you put it in the Viewmaster. So every click was this awe-inspiring uh, thing of like you were in the picture. William Gruber had a passion for stereo photography. The process of combining two pictures taken from slightly different points of view 
into one full-color three-dimensional image. The problem was that in order to see his pictures, he had to use turn-of-the-century viewers, which were delicate and clumsy to operate. So Gruber put a new spin on an old idea and invented the Viewmaster, a device which displayed a series of color 3D images stored on one easy-to-use reel. Over the years, the Viewmaster has come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. But today's model works exactly the same as Gruber's first edition. A Viewmaster reel consists of seven stereo pairs, so there's 14 pieces of film in a reel. When you're looking at a reel through a viewer, your left eye sees the left image, your right eye sees the right image. And your brain puts those two images together. When your brain looks at both of those eyes and puts them together, you get a very impressive 3D picture. And that's what gives stereo art and 3D Viewmaster art its 3D effect. Gruber's gadget caught the eye of the American public. By 1941, over 1,000 dealers nationwide were selling Viewmasters. One of the interesting slogans that Viewmaster had in its early years was, what in the world would you like to see? And people took trips all over the world through their Viewmaster. With the introduction of cartoon characters and children's stories in the 1950s, Viewmaster attracted a loyal kid following, and the device truly became a toy. The popularity of these stereo images continues to astound. Since its inception, billions of reels and millions of viewers have been sold. The success far outreached even the wildest dreams of William Gruber. For 60 years, Viewmaster has turned out an endless library of wondrous 3D images, each view created with an intricate production process. Viewmaster has two major areas of uh, projects, uh, live action and animation. The animation Viewmaster starts with an artist who creates the drawing which will become the right half of the 3D image. Once I'm done drawing the lines on this view, it goes over to the stereo artist who takes this right eye view and makes a left eye view of it. When you look into a Viewmaster, each eye looks at something from a slightly different angle, and we have to mock that when we draw it. And that's what gives it the 3D effect. The stereo images, whether originated from photographs or artists' drawings, ultimately end up as color slides that are used to produce the final Viewmaster reels. The popularity of this magic portal continues to captivate viewers from around the world. Countless children have been transported to faraway places, all without leaving the comfort and safety of their home. But for other fantasy travelers, a journey to this make-believe world begins in a basement, an attic, or even the living room floor. Over the last hundred years, grown-up hobbyists have traveled millions of miles down the winding tracks of Lionel trains. I think what it delivers to adults and children is the ability to imagine and take you anywhere you want. You know, I mean, I hold a piece and my whole world comes back to me of when I was a kid. If you talk to any adult hobbyist or any adult collector, inevitably the conversation comes back to their own childhood. Let it go. There we go. We have it. 
a crash. We got a crash. Actor Mandy Patinkin is a Lionel Train fanatic. On this board, we've got it set up so we can run up to, I think, 50 trains. We can run up. We have a... And his elaborate train set is never far from his thoughts. This is the green line, which is right here. This is the yellow line, which is right here. The layout is your whole world. The layout is better than your home. Mandy is not alone. Over 50 million adults over the age of 18 have owned a Lionel train. What was to become the nation's most successful toy train company started by chance. In 1900, Joshua Cowan, an electronics expert, developed a unique idea. As a resident of New York City, I had walked by many of the retail stores in New York and felt that the static displays that he saw could be enhanced if there was some animation to them and that would draw customers into the store. So he developed a gondola or a single unit train that would run in the retail store window People were very interested and intrigued by Cowan's animated advertisement, but instead of purchasing the featured products, customers wanted to buy the trains. Joshua Cowan chose his middle name as the company name and started to manufacture Lionel model trains. The product quickly captured the fancy of America. Model railroading is certainly about trains, but more than anything else, it's about imagination. It's about having fun. And we like to say that our products are inspired by the real railroads, but we don't hold ourselves slaves to reality. By 1955, Lionel had become the largest manufacturer of toy trains, and the Lionel train sets had become a symbol for the American family. Happy prosperous, productive. Over the decades, Lionel designed products that reflected the times in which we lived. If you look at the history of our products, you can see the history of the United States. During periods of war, many of our products were military inspired. And uh, during the space race, for example, many of our products were inspired by that space race because it captured the attention and imagination of the nation. Lionel trains continue to capture the imagination of children and adult hobbyists alike. This is one of the great cars that Lionel ever put out. It's called the aquarium car. So you turn it on, and a little guy comes out and says hello. And then he pops back in, but i got to repair it because it's a little busted. I haven't fixed it yet. A lot of people complain because they say the Gateman is not O scale, which is the scale of the train. They say he's too big. I could care less. Today, the Lionel product line includes over 350 trains and accessories. And there, now look, 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 at, the, uh, look at the smoke. The smoke really goes when when it's going. This authentic aura has made Lionel Trains one of the longest lasting of the classic toys. I set it up hoping I would have a special relationship with my kids with it. But they don't have the passion I do. They think that's dad's room. And I, and I finally got to the point where I realized I'm allowed to have my room and have my toys. And everybody can play with it.
Panasonic is making ordinary camcorders extinct. Because our new palm quarter camcorder is also a digital still camera. Its pictures can be emailed. And since it's from Panasonic, its tapes play a new VCR. The palm quarter with built-in digital still camera from Panasonic. Just slightly ahead of our time. Remember just how good homemade soup can taste? Well, it'll all come back to you at Tim Hortons. When you try a delicious new Tim's own chicken noodle, it's got bow tie pasta noodles, sliced carrots, red peppers, and chunks of seasoned chicken, all in a hearty chicken broth. New Tim's own chicken noodle. You'll love every drop. No matter how you get it, come home for lunch at Tim Hortons. appreciates the value of a dollar. Introducing the limited edition Maxima Diaz. Nostalgia is where we find it. In the lumpy contours of Mr. Potato Head, the indescribable aroma of Play-Doh, the irritating buzz around operation, and in the unique creations of Mark's Toys. M-A-R-X spells Mark's world's largest toy maker. Groucho, Carl, and Lewis. Three Marxes who profoundly influenced our world. But it was Lewis that built an empire by broadcasting childhood dreams over the airwaves. When we remember classic toys of the 50s and 60s, the innovative commercials of Mark's Toys comes to mind. Attacking from all sides. Situation called for the gigantic power pack missile cannon on wheels. I would consider that period of time, the 1955 to 1965 time, the golden glory days of Mark's Toys. Capturing the flag of our popular culture makes for a memorable toy. And Marx captured that flag over and over again. You get a portable drill. Marx made politically incorrect toys aimed at boys. Wow, look at that. Hey, is it real? Looks like real. Hey, it sounds like real. And politically incorrect pre-feminist movement toys aimed at girls. She comes a lovely lady with a vanity all her own. They manufactured almost every type of toy conceivable. Steel trucks, mechanical toys, plastic, vehicles. And, of course, they were the forefront of the promotional products. Those famous toys that we see and recognize and remember and always say, wow, those were Mark's toys. Toys follow the trends of the nation. Consider the late 50s, early 60s. Sputnik was launched. The space race was on. Aliens were attacking. Monsters were in vogue, and Marx made great Garlu. You can make Garlu go. Yes, great Garlu, almost two feet tall, will be your faithful servant. You're the boss. So make friends. Marx Toys boss. served as a cultural barometer for the times. The people at Marx Toys in research and development said if guns are popular, robots are popular, why don't we combine them into one fantastic? Big product. It's Big Lou, giant moon robot by Marx. Because of its size, it was the biggest robot on the market. They named him Big. And to come up with a first name, sort of as an inside joke, they thought, what could be bigger than Louis Marx? So they took the Lou 
from Lewis. Bargain price, Big Lou! But Big Lou wasn't Marx's biggest selling robot toy. This commercial matched Rocky Graziano with one of Marx's most beloved creations, the Rock'em Sock'em Robots. The other, a left. Knock his black off, and you're the winner. I want a rematch. And fighting robots were just the beginning of the Marxist quest for world toy domination. The big wheels are rolling. We at Marx had the big wheel, one of the all-time superstars. That's the big wheel by Marx. It's the coolest. Sadly, the golden era of Marx toys reached its end when Lewis Marx retired in 1972. Lewis Marx would be proud of the toys that Marx Toys makes today. They're in the true tradition of Marx. High quality, high value, at low prices. And boy, are they fun. Our favorite toys live today, hidden in attics and on the shelves of designer antique stores. Classic versions of those classic toys command large sums of money. Who can stop it? Who can control this monstrous creature? What you cost $17.95 in 1962 can lumber into your display case for a mere $2,500. Batteries definitely not included. While these classic toys are collected partly as investments, they are also highly sought after for a more ephemeral reason. They remain our diving boards into the fountain of youth. I think at any point in your life when you start to second-guess your career and double-think all your choices, 